and good afternoon. Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries are located in one of the most disaster-prone regions in the world. In addition, the area is particularly susceptible to the effects of climate change. The countries in the region are facing increasingly intense and unpredictable weather events, which not only pose threats to the environment, but also endanger the safety and well-being of their populations. This condition has prompted Medicine Sans Frontier or Doctors Without Border to direct their attention and work to the region, including Indonesia. The international president of MSF, Mr. Christos Christou, is visiting Indonesia and engaging in meeting with the government authorities and Asian members representatives in Jakarta. With operation in over 70 countries worldwide, the organization aims to strengthen its collaboration with Indonesia and neighboring countries in addressing humanitarian crisis and global health concerns. I'm Purwani Diafrabandari, and you are watching Temple Talks. Today, the international president of MFSF is here with us, Mr. Christos Christou. Mr. Christou, welcome to Tempo and welcome to Tempo Talks. It's an honor for us to have you here. It's a pleasure and thank you for having me. Is it the first time you come to Indonesia? Yes, it's my first so, time and I'm so, so excited. Oh, <laughs> so, how's the first experience then? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great experience. I'm so pleased to see uh, Happy people are welcoming me and uh, they are all so kind. And I'm uh, looking forward to engaging with uh, all, not uh, just authorities, but also uh, the people in the region. Right. What is actually your agenda for your visit in, to Indonesia and how is it going so far? Uh, I think you summarized it very well at the beginning uh, because uh, the main objective of my visit is related to uh, responses to natural disasters. Right. And we try to understand uh, how we can uh, help, but also how can we learn from the experience that the region had all these years in uh, natural disasters. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is uh, to work together to set up uh, trainings. Uh, we have uh, the... Uh, emergency e-hub, as we call it, mm -hmm. which is uh, an exercise where we provide trainings together with the Minister of Health in different districts. And we focus in uh, understanding what is a better uh, way to respond to natural disasters. How is it progressing? So far, so good. Uh, I mean, uh, people uh, welcome uh, this. Uh, we actually had on Saturday uh, a first uh, training with a district a hospital. And um, the main aspects of these uh, have to do with uh, the psychosocial support. We try to understand how to make most uh, use out of the um, informative uh, uh, systems, the geographical information systems. And we also provide uh, our experience from different uh, conflicts and responses in, uh, in terms of uh, mass casualty uh, uh, accidents and how to, to provide the health on them. It's not for all over Indonesia, right? So it's just some regions here for this program. Well, uh, we start with this, uh, but uh, our uh, our vision and our ambition is uh, to uh, expand also in other places. Mm. Okay. And what about the result with the ASEAN members' representatives that you met with some of them, of course? Yes, uh, it was a great opportunity to come in this specific uh, uh, time of the year uh, they're all here. They all have uh, uh, serious meetings. And of course, Indonesia is chairing the ASEAN uh, uh, region these uh, days until the end of the year. So I wanted to not just engage with them, but address uh, two key issues. The one is the responses to the natural disasters mm -hmm. and all the climate emergency mm -hmm. that comes behind it but uh, also uh, to uh, share our concerns on the situation of uh, people on the move 
and especially by the Rohingya population. Okay. What do you think the most serious threat to Indonesia in terms of the emergency preparedness priorities? And how do you see Indonesia dealing with it? There is a lot of experience in responding to natural disaster, <laughs> but uh, what we can do together is to coordinate better. And uh, before uh, the next problem comes, and I hope it never comes, but uh, we need to know each other and understand what uh, MSF, Doctors Without Borders, can do to complement the already existing response by the authorities here. Mm. So how do you see about the government response? <laughs> uh, they're very interesting in uh, working with us. Uh, and uh, these days we are reviewing also the memorandum of understanding. We try to make it more dynamic and more flexible in order to be able to respond also in unprecedented crises that we may have. What is the most serious uh, threat to Indonesia in terms of like disaster or um, climate change? <laughs> or probably it's already the climate crisis right now. Exactly. I think it's uh, this uh, climate emergency that we should all uh, focus, and especially regions like uh, the one we are sitting in uh, today. Uh, climate emergencies are not only related to natural disasters that we see sometimes they are getting even more deteriorated. Mm -hmm. We see uh, also uh, other uh, problems that we didn't have in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, we see Pacific Island nations getting literally disappearing under the sea because of the rise of the sea levels. We also see several uh, health consequences uh, to people uh, related to the climate uh, emergencies. And um, we, are, we are worried uh, not only to the natural disasters, but uh, all other consequences that they can cause to health, that they are longer term, and uh, they may not be that visible when we talk about climate crisis. Can you elaborate about that? Yes, for example, um, all these changes in the climate these days uh, have uh, caused uh, more resistant uh, uh, species of uh, mosquitoes. So uh, we see a higher burden of diseases like mm -hmm. dengue or malaria. Yeah. And uh, the alternation of floods or droughts may be not that visible in this part of the world, mm -hmm. but in other places uh, that we intervene, like uh, in African countries, we see that they have caused the serious problems with malnutrition and uh, with um, the movement of the people within and outside their own countries. And these are roughly a few of the medical consequences that we have. And next to this, we can add also the air pollution that affects the people in the longer term and we are not very aware of. Yeah, so it's actually so many people is already aware about the climate change impacts on the nature and people lives, but it's, you know, Sometimes they just don't think about the impacts to the people's health, right? And I don't know if you talk to many Indonesians or to some Indonesians if they really care about it. Well, I don't think that Indonesians care less than others. I think that um, all around the world, there are still some uh, denialists. And um, I think uh, our work today is also to uh, do our best to sensitize the people. Because in most of the places where we intervene, Wherever we work these days, we see both the direct and the indirect consequences of climate emergency and uh, the environmental degradation to the people's health. Yeah. And what do we have to do to handle it and prevent it from getting worse? There are several things. Uh, one very important is um, mitigate as much as possible these uh, emissions. In other words, we know that fossil fuel mm -hmm. is the main reason now of all this climate crisis and we have to look at it mm -hmm. and do as much as possible now. Next to that, many countries that they will be affected mostly, they need also to find all adaptation measures to adapt to what is going to come next. And uh, the third very important uh, component of uh, our response is uh, related to all the losses and damages uh, that uh, may come and how we request extra funds to uh, really uh, protect these countries. And these are the three key uh, areas uh, of uh, uh, what we are planning also to assist all these countries with in the light of the next COP in Dubai, the COP28, right. where... Uh, 
I'm very pleased at least to see that this year we will have one day related uh, to health in the agenda of the COP. And how do you see the response of the Indonesian government or also the neighboring countries' government on this issue? They have to play a leading role, which uh, there's still a lot of space to improve there and uh, do that. They have to really prepare themselves for these agendas. Yeah. And uh, next to the adaptation measures, they have to push hard for loss and damages. Uh -huh. And uh, we, need, uh, we know that, uh, that we need more money to come through funding mechanisms. So now it's this. not enough? <laughs> no, it's not Nobody. enough. It's not okay. enough. And I'm afraid that uh, the easy way is uh, to recycle the already existing money from humanitarian crisis responses to uh, those responses that are related to climate change. But this is not going to resolve the problem. Taking money from one place, put it in another, may provide some solutions, but they will cause more problems in the other side. Right. So we need more money. We need new money. And I think uh, Asian region and their leaders need to push hard for this. There is a commitment from the international communities, especially from the developed countries, right, for this kind of project. Yes, commitments are there, but it's not well, enough. The money is <laughs> and, uh, and that's where uh, leaders from the region can be really uh, more pushy on this. And uh, organizations like mine are always there to explain why it is so important to link health to all the climate emergency and treat this as a, a serious humanitarian uh, uh, crisis as well. About the health problem. But um, is there any significant health issue that Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries must anticipate seriously? We should be uh, very worried about um, the dengue fever and the higher burden that we see these days. We should be worried about the air pollution, something that um, also MSF cannot really analyze at the moment, but we know that it exists here. We should be extremely cautious of uh, waterborne diseases. Water. And uh, this is like, uh, yes, everything that has to do with sanitation of the water. As drinkable water is very important because otherwise you can have a series of uh, gastrointestinal problems. And especially in uh, the uh, little children, they can uh, even uh, be very fatal. Hmm. And what MSF can uh, do to help on this situation? We are here to share experience that we have from outbreaks from all over the world. And uh, we are here to, uh, to work hand in hand uh, with the authorities, with uh, them being always on the driving seat and us uh, complementing uh, what uh, needs may uh, exist by, I repeat, uh, sharing our know-how. And uh, maybe sometimes this is not enough, but uh, don't forget that uh, although we were present in uh, Indonesia since many, many years and we have a long history, it is now that we introduce MSF to the society and it is now that we want the authorities to get to know us better in order to work together. And what about the pandemic? I mean, it's like the threat of pandemic in the future. We come out from a pandemic and uh, we need to learn a lot of lessons from that. There are many lessons there, but uh, I, I, I don't think we have learned from them yet. And in the light of uh, preparing for the next pandemic, mm -hmm. which I hope doesn't come or doesn't come soon, uh, we have to uh, really go back and see what didn't go well. And one of the things that didn't go well with this pandemic was uh, all the products related to COVID were not treated as common goods. We wow. found them mostly distributed in those wealthy places in the world. And I'm not only referring to the vaccines. This could be the case also with diagnostics. This could be the case also with other treatments and all the protective equipment. 
So wealthy countries have more, while at the same time, the most less developed countries, let's say, they didn't have even enough to protect the staff, the healthcare workers. Okay, so it still becomes a serious problem for everyone in the world, right? <laughs> it is, and maybe a solution there, or uh, something that I already address with all uh, the leaders that I meet these days, is that uh, Indonesia and the region can really play an important role in developing the capacity and getting this, what we call, self-reliance. Okay. They can start with uh, making a diagnostic hub, they can develop diagnostic tools, and maybe later also share with others the experience and the know-how in order to be able to respond to the next pandemic without waiting from the big pharmaceutical companies in I Europe see. or US to do that. So strengthen the cooperation with other countries too, of course. That is uh, crucial, that yeah. is integral. Yeah. MSF operates in conflict zones, providing humanitarian aid to refugees, for migrants and, uh, port migrants and internally displaced persons, right? And currently, which regions are experiencing the most severe crisis? As you said, we are in more than 70 countries. Uh, we are an organization that thanks to more than 7 million uh, people, individuals donating to us, supporting Seven us, million. we have uh, the quite unique financial independence. Mm -hmm. We do not rely on any money or any financial support by governments. And this gives us all the space to go there where we think that most of the problems exist. Mm. And out of these 70 uh, countries these days, I can uh, bring uh, a few examples where there are protracted crises, but people do not talk a lot about them. Where is that? Yemen is a place yeah. where after the ceasefire last year, right. the situation is still very tense. There are huge humanitarian needs with vaccination gaps, with uh, malnutrition, with uh, several primary health care diseases and uh, services that they are missing. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria and North Syria, especially after the earthquake, have oh, yeah. also affected a lot. So still a lot of problems. And there are many others <laughs> that uh, I would like to share with you by names. Right. Like, uh, yes, we also are extremely worried about the situation in Ukraine. We right, that's the new problem. Yes, in Ethiopia, in Tigray, after the war, the situation is very unstable. And uh, just to name a few of the places uh, where protracted conflicts exist. Right. And let us not forget that also we have more than 1 million uh, refugees, uh, the Rohingyas people in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, and they live in a precarious situation and very inhumane conditions. Yeah, talking about the Rohingya, that's, this is the Southeast Asia countries issue, right? So um, how should Asian countries address this situation concerning Rohingya refugees? It is important to understand that Asian countries here uh, and the region can play a, a leading role in, uh, uh, in the diplomacy and in sorting the problem. And I, I strongly believe that any solution must come from, from this region. Uh, I don't know how this solution will look like, and especially uh, the political aspects of that is something that I cannot comment and I cannot have the analysis. However, I do know, and I'm pretty convinced, that if there is one thing that we can start with is enabling the humanitarians to provide more of the uh, humanitarian aid uh, to all this population. And I'm referring especially to the people in Rakhine region at the moment, yeah. where they have also been affected a lot by uh, the very recent cyclone Mocha. MSF is there. MSF was always there. We never abandoned all this population the last uh, more than two years. And uh, we can do more. We need the access to be there and stand by those people that they need us. And I'm not only referring to Rohingya people there. All the population has serious needs. MSF can provide more of what they do today. So MSF doesn't have uh, access to those people, even in the Rakhine state? It's very restricted, and I'm sure that we can do more. And I would like uh, the Myanmar authorities also to give us more space in order to be more close with more things to the population that they need us. And how do you see Indonesia respond on this kind of issue, about, especially about the Rohingya? And probably it's also with other refugees in the 
the coming to Indonesia, probably just for temporarily, but uh, they are here. So how do you think about that? Indonesia is a country that can uh, welcome the people and uh, really try their best to alleviate the suffering of those they need. Mm -hmm. They are very aware of the situation. They chair the ASEAN uh, uh, region these days, uh, so they can play a role there. And as I had uh, these conversations with uh, the authorities of Indonesia these days, MSF is also standby and always willing to assist with any request that they may come, especially from those uh, hotspots that are receiving uh, uh, refugees. Okay. on personal notes, of course. You have been a long time with the MSF, right? And um, also you have been assigned in some conflict zones and difficult area, challenging areas. So what initially motivated you to join the organization and what keeps you still stay there till now? I graduated the medical school and I always wanted to become a doctor to help others. Okay. But uh, I realized uh, when I started my career that uh, maybe this is not enough. I wanted to stand in solidarity to those people that they are mostly excluded, those that they are left behind. And these people were not um, in my hospital or in my own uh, country. These people are everywhere around the world. We have pockets of exclusion and poverty everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to join an organization that has this as their primary objective. This is what we call our imperative, the humanitarian imperative, to, to, to stand by those that they are uh, needing uh, us more. And, and that's how I started my journey. Of course, it's not an easy journey. Uh, many times uh, you feel uh, disappointed, uh, you feel discouraged. You may lose all this passion because uh, you see that the world is not improving. Yeah. But at the end, what keeps you there is the hope that you give to people. And uh, when, uh, when you stand by the people, when you try your best, no matter if sometimes you don't have enough to offer to them, but they look at your eyes and they say, thank you for being here. Thank you for treating me as a human being. This gives me hope to carry on. And this is what matters more. The feelings. <laughs> okay. And you still want to work there for a longer time, right? I will always be excited with uh, such an organization and uh, I will always be proud of what we do. And of course, I understand that sometimes it's not easy and sometimes we could do more, but uh, we keep trying and engaging with these people, engaging with their communities will help us also to learn and become better. Can you share with us um, <clears throat> some of the most impactful experience or memorable experience during your work with MSF, of course? There are several examples, but what I said before matters a lot because I remember once I was in a, in a project and um, there was an HIV patient that um, uh, when he heard that I'm not going to stay for longer and I'm leaving the project, he decided to stop his antiretroviral treatment because he felt like there's no hope, uh, he's leaving. I tried to explain to him that, uh, you know, uh, somebody else will come and uh, take over from me. And, you know, I'm, I'm another human. I have my family. I have to go back uh, home. And he said, no, no, doctor, you're not a human. You are my hope. <laughs> and wow. uh, and uh, that uh, is something that I always remember because this is what uh, MSF uh, can be about. And there are several moments where you really feel like uh, you offer something because we are in the middle of a chain. From one side are all these people that they want to support us. And from the other side are the people that they receive the support. 
and we are there to implement this for happening. But each one of this chain is a very equal and important part. And sometimes those supporting becomes also those that they need our help. So that is very powerful in MSF. This is one of the moments that I always bring in my mind. So it's not just help, but it's also hope. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very help, important. It's hope, is right. is human dignity, <laughs> is standing in solidarity to those people that they need. Right. So what's about the current key challenge that MSF is facing? Well, excellent question. Maybe many challenges because I think that uh, the humanitarian environment these days is becoming more hostile and uh, is not that friendly to humanitarian uh, NGOs like uh, Medicines Sans Frontières. But if there is one thing, is uh, the restricted access. We don't have access to all those people that they need us. And we would like to have more. And next to this, we experience more and more medical at attacks to the medical care. Our hospitals getting bombed, our activity somehow uh, sometimes is criminalized. So we would like everyone to respect the very few conventions we have and uh, the, what we call the international humanitarian law to understand that um, the doctors are doctors and doctors of their enemies should not become their enemies but just stay doctors and be able to be everywhere where there is a need. Okay. Mr. Christo, thank you for the insightful conversation. But before we conclude this program, probably you still have something that you think important to say. Well, I really want to thank you for giving us this opportunity. I think that uh, Indonesia as a, as a society has a lot of potential to um, come closer uh, to uh, what MSF is uh, here about. And uh, I'm pleased uh, to have this opportunity to introduce MSF to you. I, we share the same values. We share the same uh, you know, uh, concerns about uh, humanity and about the future of this world. So let's uh, learn from each other. Okay, thank you. Thank you and very much. Thank you for your time. Viewers, thank you for watching us. I'm Purwani Prabandari. You can watch the next Temple Talks in the following month with another interesting topic and another interesting guest. Good day.